My Underwater Odyssey um, started way back in 1990 and it was on the first day of university. Uh, it wasn't a premeditated step. Uh, I'd actually wanted to learn to fly and so I'd set my sights on a glorious career in aerospace. Um, I consequently chose to read mechanical engineering at one of the UK's top engineering universities. Uh, that university was just about as far away from the sea as you can actually get in the UK. But nevertheless, it had a university branch of the British Subaqua Club, the governing body for the sport in the UK. A friend of mine who was a member invited me for a tri-dive, and I was instantly and unexpectedly hooked. I just loved being underwater, and still do. Um, and so began my sport diving career. And although I didn't realise it at the time, there was a shift in the direction of my professional career as well. Uh, several years uh, later, my work, and by now my passion, and some would say my obsession with the underwater world, started to get closer. And, and that's when I joined a company in the northeast of England um, who was who are, who are experts in subsea engineering, and I joined as an engineer designing and building underwater remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, as they are called. Now, uh, at that time, I was based in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England, and being so close to the Scottish border, I went on many diving expeditions at the weekend to explore the clear waters of its west coast and dive some absolutely stunning underwater reefs and pinnacles and shipwrecks. Those memorable dives included some dives on one of the world's largest whirlpools, the Corryvreckan, and that's located between the islands of Jura and Scarborough. Now, to dive these areas safely, you need a very experienced dive team operating at a level way beyond your average holiday or club diver. I witnessed at first hand the awesome power of the tides, uh, but I had some conflicted views on this. So with my engineering head on, I was thinking, how on earth do we harness this power? But with my diving head on, I was thinking, well, not at the expense of getting in the way of a good dive. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, uh, in 2005, I got the opportunity to build one of the world's first tidal energy turbines, and a sizable one at that, rated at one megawatt. Uh, since then, I've been involved in many tidal energy projects, including some down here on the Isle of Wight. And it was that work that brought me here almost eight years ago now. So um, I've become somebody who's known as an Ovener, so somebody who lives here, but doesn't originate from here. So, although there is quite a lot I could tell you about tidal energy, especially given some of the exciting plans that are happening around here at the moment, that's where I need to leave that topic for now. What I want to do is take you back to Scotland first. So, um, as well as noting the awesome power of the oceans, I'd also started to witness the unsustainable impact that industrial fishing and fish farming were, and still are, having on the seabed. I led a diving expedition to a small group of islands north of Ullapool called the Summer Isles. And based on my previous Scottish diving experience, I was expecting to see some great walls, reefs, in clear blue Atlantic water with white sandy seabeds stuffed full of juicy scallops. What greeted me were scenes of underwater devastation, a flat, barren seabed with just broken and rotting corpses of every sort of marine life. And the reason for that came quite clear when a small scallop dredger came round the corner and it was able to get its fishing gear extremely close, right up to the base of the rocky islands we, from which we were diving. On another diving expedition, um, I came across some slow-growing deep water corals, and these presumably came from the rock or bank way out into the Atlantic. So I actually didn't see these whilst diving, I didn't see them in an aquarium, and I didn't see them in a science laboratory either. Uh, rather, we recovered them from rubbish skips at the quayside, alongside the broken and discarded fishing net that had ripped them up from the seabed in the first place. 
the problem that the ocean has is that most people are just simply not aware of what happens to it, and especially the seabed. Um, especially in the cold, hostile, uh, and often quite murky waters around the UK. I've met fishermen in the past who have argued passionately that dredging the seabed is actually good for it, because it's a bit like ploughing a field on land. It isn't. It's, it's more like driving a bulldozer through a rainforest to catch a butterfly. So, um, and that's not the only thing. So recent research indicates that it's not only habitat that is being destroyed, but carbon dioxide that is being released. So some recent studies estimate that up to one billion tonnes of carbon dioxide are being released in ways like this, and that's a similar amount to what's being generated by the global aviation industry. So what are we going to do about it then? Humanity, collectively, has a responsibility for stewardship of the planet. Uh, it's the only one that we've got. But what do we do as individuals to make a difference? Well, let, let's start with the sport diving community for a start. After all, they see things underwater that for most people are just simply out of sight and out of mind. They can raise awareness of what is happening to the seabed and bring that to the attention of the public. They can gather evidence to support their campaigns and data to feed into scientific databases so that more informed decisions can be made. And there's already many volunteer projects around the UK and the list is growing. Uh, Project Seagrass, for example, was established to help reverse the loss of seagrass by turning research into effective conservation effort. Uh, you can all participate in this. You download their Sea Spotter application, and where you see seagrass around the UK, you record where you find it. And there's quite a bit of it around the island that could do with being monitored. The Marine Conservation Society have been mobilising volunteer divers for years, monitoring and recording sea life through their sea search project. And I've seen and met local interest groups who've successfully campaigned to ban scallop dredging in their area and also raise awareness of the pollution that is caused by industrial farming of salmon in sheltered sea locks. So um, we, we really need to get far smarter about how we fish. Uh, fishermen do need to earn a living, but they need to do so without destroying the seabed in the first place. And the other thing we need to do is to restore the seabed that has been destroyed by decades of industrial fishing. So how do we do this? Well, uh, currently there's a lot of interest in restoring the native flat oyster populations around the UK. And that's in no small part due to the work done by the Native Oyster Network of the UK and Ireland, which in turn is a collaboration between the University of Portsmouth, just over there somewhere, and the Zoological Society of London. Now, Austria edelis, as these creatures are scientifically known, were once the food of the poor. Some 700 million were consumed in London alone in 1864. And, uh, <laughs> so, but unfortunately, uh, by the end of the reign of Queen Victoria, they were starting to become the preserve of the rich rather than the food of the poor. So what is it that these oysters can do apart from appear on a plate in front of you to be consumed alongside a very nice glass of French wine, maybe? Well, these mollusks provide numerous eco-services. For a start, they can improve water clarity. An adult oyster can filter up to 200 litres of water per day, removing all sorts of contaminants. Improved water quality and clarity is good for other species, uh, like seagrass, which then helps sequest carbon back into the environment. Uh, they can also uh, help reduce algae blooms, which are caused by nutrients which are washed off from, from surrounding farmers' fields. And they can also help stabilise the seabed by forming the cold water equivalent of coral reefs. 
helping to protect the coast from erosion and also providing a habitat for loads of other species. Some other, some 466 according to some uh, recent research. Uh, not only that, they can also sequest carbon back into their shells and then back into the seabed. Uh, so given their capabilities, I just can't help thinking that they could potentially help turn the solent blue. Now, for those of you not familiar with the solent, what you need to realise is that most of the time it isn't blue. It's more like a grey-green colour, and quite often it's brown due to river sediment, sewerage effluent, or wave action just stirring up the shore. So as a diver, uh, the furthest I've seen underwater in the Solent is about three to four metres on a good day. On the worst days in winter, it's about half a metre or less. Outside the Solent, I've dived in visibility of about 25 metres, the same distance as the length of your average swimming pool. Clearly, I'm interested in this filtration capacity that the oysters have, about 200 litres of water per day. So just imagine what the filtration capability is of 700 million oysters, the same quantity that London ate way back in 1864. That w works out to the staggering 140 billion litres water per day. OK, it's a mind-boggling number. Let's try and put it into an island context. The six main sewerage treatment plants on the island are licensed to discharge a mere 32 million litres of treated effluent per day. Some 4,000 times less than the hypothetical and filtration capacity of those oysters. OK, so the problem we have now, there isn't that quantity of oysters on the seabed. One of the other problems we have is that we do lots of rainfall and then the sewerage system can't cope and it dumps largely untreated sewerage into our rivers and into the sea and that's to stop it backing up through the system, coming out of your toilet or bath or kitchen sink the wrong way or causing more widespread flooding. So I just can't help think that if we had 19th century levels of oysters on the seabed and Solent and around the island, wouldn't that be a good idea to help mitigate the risk of storm outfall? And it Historical anecdotal evidence suggests that water clarity was indeed better when there were large oyster reefs and beds. And I'm inclined to believe that because I've seen the effect of other species around the world. Uh, the zebra mussels in Canada did a great job of cleaning up the Great Lakes, so you can actually see the shipwrecks in them. And I've dived gigantic seawater caves in New Zealand where the seawater is being filtered gin clear by the sponges that line the back of the cave wall. So practically, what are we going to do then? How can we increase the number of oysters? Uh, the big idea is this. Shouldn't we be habitually planting the equivalent of seeds back on the seabed rather than just harvesting? After all, farmers on land, plant seeds to their crops to cultivate a reasonable harvest. They'd simply take, they have to put something in to get something out. So the question is, could we put enough oysters back on the seabed so that we not only resurrect a sustainable commercial fishery, so fishermen can earn a living, um, but also that we build natural capital so that we're doing things like keeping the water clean around the island for a start. Well, there are already projects attempting to boost the number of native oysters. The Wild Oyster Project is a collaboration between British Marine, the Zoological Society of London, and Blue Marine Foundation. And what it is doing is placing cages of fertile oysters underneath marina pontoons so that they can reproduce and spread larvae back into the wild. And there are some of these cages over at Whiteling Ferries in Lymington just in that direction, just over the other side of Solent, very close by. Closer to my own heart is the British Sabacra Club's Operation Oyster Project, mainly because I lead it. <laughs> it's in the discovery phase at the moment, and we're encouraging UK divers to seek out remnant native oyster populations around the UK. You don't have to be a diver to contribute. Um, 
Beachcombers, swimmers, snorkelers, freedivers can all, all help pinpoint both historical and current locations of native flat oyster populations. All you have to do is to take a photograph of the live oysters if you see them, or their shells if you don't see any live oysters, or fill in a few details on the British Subaqua Club's Operation Oyster website, either on your smartphone or your laptop, upload your images and press submit. We will then take that data and feed it into national databases. That data in turn can then help inform future restoration projects or gather genetically diverse broodstock to help cultivate new oysters. So uh, if you're like me and you're passionate about saving the blue planet, can I encourage you all to get actively involved in projects like these? And so maybe in our own lifetimes, we have a chance of helping turn the Solent blue. Thank you.